gentlemen, San Bonani, Bolweni, good evening, Tobela. It is indeed a great honor and special privilege for me to welcome you to the professorial inauguration, inaugural lecture of Professor Mkedisin Lekiana. As I do so, I wish to express a warm welcome to his loved ones, special guests, and his colleagues. This is indeed a proud and joyful, yet a landmark moment for all of you. For Professor Ndlejana himself, and of course for us here at UJ, and higher education in South Africa and beyond. The inauguration of professors is a public ceremony in which newly appointed professors are inducted into office by the vice chancellor for whom I am officiating today and where they deliver their inaugural addresses. The ceremony has its roots in the medieval times and serves multiple purposes. First, it is an expression of welcome and an entry for new professors joining the circle of colleagues who are already professors. Secondly, it provides a platform for the professors to display their expertise in the discipline and showcase their research. In Isikosa, we say, Ukutwesa Isidanga Kwisigaba Sobunjinga Lwaz. This, loosely translated, refers to assuming the role of the professor. Of course, in colonial traditions subscribed to by universities, this refers to the gown and the cap. Traditionally, the wise one would accept a blanket in Gubo. Once we have listened to the inaugural address, the gown or ingubo, denoting the professorship, will be formally assumed. Today, as we gather to witness to the entry of Professor Ndlejana to the illustrious community of scholars of the university, it is a celebration of the contributions to the discipline and ultimately the impact on society. Professors, Professor Ndlejana, provide a university with its identity with its character, academic legitimacy, and integrity. The inaugural lecture is a rite of passage following the confirmation of the appointment of the person as a professor. It has not yet happened. This evening, we will listen to Professor Ndlejana as the gown goes to town. By this, I mean that the power of the inaugural address is when the expertise is showcased beyond the corridors of the university and reverberates throughout society. It stands out as a moment of pride for the incumbent and the family, fellow scholars, the university, and ultimately society. For the German philosopher and diplomat Humboldt, a university referred to the whole community of scholars and students engaged in a common search for truth. Newman talked about teaching universal knowledge. Recently, universities have been viewed as instrumentalists, serving the purpose of the economy or utilitarian in purpose. I would hope that we can break out of these narrow conceptualizations and reflect on a university as contributing to the public good. Edward said in an article, I quote unquote, on defiance and taking positions, offers a formulation of the ideal role of a true intellectual as one who commands a vast knowledge of his or her discipline, who is rigorous in the analysis of literature, who views being an intellectual as a vocation, the intellectual who considers it necessary to step into the public sphere and to speak truth to power, namely to question, to interpret and understand authority rather than consolidating it. Mm -hmm. To step out of the boundaries of the academy, to connect oneself, to affiliate oneself, to align oneself with an ongoing process or context of some sort, perhaps with the aim of improving the lot of the oppressed. The intellectual who functions as a kind of public memory to recall what is forgotten or ignored, to make the connections or otherwise hidden 
and to provide alternatives for mistaken policies. It remains then that for us as a university with a pan-Africanist vision that we derive our mandate as intellectuals and as professors from the university. How do we embrace the role of a professor as a disruptor while continuing to be flagship carriers of our disciplines? This evening, ladies and gentlemen, we will be listening to Professor Ndik Lekiana as one further step in the journey of being a professor. This is a journey that does not culminate once this lecture has been given. It is a self-reflective pause in the journey of a professor with the promise of more to enrich our minds while simultaneously contributing to the rich intellectual body of work in the discipline. Ladies and gentlemen, please allow me to invite the Executive Dean of Professor Nlikiana, Professor Kamila Naidu, to introduce formally to you, Professor Nlikiana. Good evening, San Bonani Dumelang, Khoyanand. It gives me great pleasure to introduce you to Prof. Msebisi Ndletiana, and I'll read some extracts from his biography. Msebisi Ndletiana was born in Port Elizabeth. His grandmother, Nobisutu, was a strong influence in his early life. She was a strict disciplinarian and had a passion for education. For Nobisutu, education was more than just a qualification to secure employment. She impressed upon him that it was knowledge that entrusted those who possessed it with the responsibility to play a meaningful role in society. On completing matric at PE's Kwezi Lomso High School in 1992, MCBC enrolled at the University of Witwatersrand for a BA degree, and that marked the beginning of a long relationship with Wits, culminating in a PhD in political studies in 2004 under the supervision of the renowned political scientist, Prof. Tom Lodge. Tom Lodge sparked his interest in intellectual life. He involved students in his own research, often sending them away to do field work. Besides the healthy pocket money Msebisi accumulated through assisting Tom Lodge, the numerous field work trips also nurtured a liking for ethnography. He realized that political questions could only be answered through empirical observations and inquiry, and that there are many questions out there begging for answers. If Tom Lodge cultivated his ambition for intellectual eminence, it was Professor Gail Gerard who fashioned his tools. An equally eminent scholar of South African politics, Gail Gerard was a thorough teacher. She examined student essays, not just to grade them, but to teach students how to write. An essay would return full of red ink, commenting on vocabulary and structure, and one would have to rewrite the essay, and she would only accept it once it was in a decent shape. MCBC's first full-time job was at the Center for Policy Studies, the CPS, in the late 1990s, under the directorship of Prof. Stephen Friedman, now a professorial colleague at UJ, who provided the initial opportunity to put his training into practice. His enjoyment of applied research at the CPS validated his career choice. From the CPS, he went on to join other leading research institutions, such as the HSRC and Mapungubwe Institute for Strategic Reflection, MISTRA. Building MISTRA's initial body of research and working with Joel Nechetenze, a formidable intellectual, was a rewarding experience. However, the promise of solitude and focused intellectual pursuit offered by an academic life proved irresistible. The University of Johannesburg, then under the formative hands of Prof. Iron Rensburg, was just the right place to be in. Prof. Chilitsi Marwala, who was then Deputy Vice Chancellor, also provided constant reassurance that UJ would become the leading university in South Africa. And Prof. Morwala was correct. Today, UJ is rated second in the, in the country, a feat it achieved, according to Prof. Ndletiana, uh, 
partly because UJ provides academics such as himself with resources and space to contribute towards its excellence. Since arriving at UJ in 2015, Prof. Inletiana's publications have multiplied. His latest book, entitled Anatomy of the ANC in Power, Insights from Port Elizabeth, 1990 to 2019, earned him the, the 2021 Top Researcher Award in the Faculty of Humanities. His other recent publications with colleagues at Mistra contained the text, Marriages of Inconvenience, the Politics of Coalitions in South Africa, a seminal on coalition governments in South Africa. His next publication, co-authored with two other colleagues on the 100-year history of Fort Hare University, is due for publication early next year. He is currently working on another book with Prof. Herbert Masarumule, focusing on the Jacob Zuma presidency, and this is due for completion by the end of 2022. Alongside his academic life, Prof. Msibisi Ndletiana has continued to write for newspapers and provide political commentary. His op-eds now appear exclusively in the Mail and Guardian, which he has just recently joined as a columnist. So congratulations on all your achievements since joining UJ, Prof. Ndletiana. We are immensely proud of you and pleased to have you as one of us. We look forward now to your inaugural address entitled Public Institutions and Political Culture, Offshoots of History and Exigencies of the Moment. Thank you. All right. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Nolita. Thank you, Kabila, uh, for those generous <coughs> words of introduction. And thank you to you too, uh, the audience, for coming, and those of you who are joining us virtually um, in this very important ritual. Um, friends and relatives, uh, in-laws, <laughs> nieces, <laughs> and especially my kids, uh, Sabata and Naledi, who are here, and of course my darling wife, Dots, uh, to be part of this very important ritual. I must say, though, some of you, when you heard about this, uh, you were shocked, actually, because some of you said, well, went to a professor, can't you already? Why? <laughs> but no, this is, uh, it goes in stages. This is the highest level, I guess. And you are here in this ritual to bear witness to that. <clears throat> um, there's no gain saying that our public institutions are in a dreadful state. This is more evident and felt strongly in our neighborhoods at the local government level. Close to 30% of our municipalities faced imminent collapse. Others can't even pay their own staff and have resorted to giving them groceries instead. Those who still have the financial resources pay a sizable amount, more than 5 billion in total towards consultant to do functions for which they have staff. This gloomy condition of our communities shows itself in uncollected waste, roads dotted with holes, and spilling sewage that have turned into streams. This dire state of our public, public institutions cries out for interrogation. How did we get here? Why was the decline not arrested earlier? These are the questions that I wish to address in this lecture this afternoon under the title Public Institutions and Public Culture or, and Political Culture, Offshoots of History and, and Exigencies of the Moment. <clears throat> this lecture is not an abstract reflection, but explains practical problems that impact on the human condition. It is in keeping with the tradition of political science to grapple with political, with practical issues that are evident in society. My contention here this afternoon is that the precarity of our public institution is a function of incongruence between their form on the one hand and the challenges of the moment on the other. They have failed to adapt and have consequently become outdated. Some adopted interim measures to aid the transition but those measures have since lapsed into permanency 
We have not remolded our institutions as we ought to have to meet the challenges of the time. And this is a collective indictment for institutions reflect who we are, an embodiment of our collective identity. Perhaps we should start from the beginning. The subject of what constitutes an ideal state has long preoccupied political science. This preoccupation was ne necessitated by the development of isolated, family-based human settlements into broader communities, contrary to earlier human settlements which had been inhabited exclusively by families or, or clans, these societies were a lot bigger and made up of a diversity of people and unrelated uh, kinsmen. There were states. Custom was consequently rendered inadequate as a basis of, of determining authority and guiding public contact and interaction. A new set of rules and authority was therefore necessary. A variety of theoretical postulations Postulations have since been provided to guide what an ideal state ought to be. For Plato, a Greek philosopher, uh, a philosopher rather, merit was critical as the foundation of a state. People are imbued with, with different talents, Plato argued, and each should be accorded a role for which they are suited. This a responsibility of government should be left to those who possess wisdom, philosopher kings, for they are best suited for that role. Though deserving of wielding this power, philosopher kings are not infallible, they are prone to greed and nepotism. And so they should be protected from, this, from these vices by not getting married and should not own property. A student of Plato, Aristotle, agreed somewhat with his former teacher but extended these teachings or his teachings. Possession of wisdom remained the absolute necessity for those in power. Accumulation of, of wisdom was a constant exercise. And for this to happen though, argued Aristotle, philosopher kings should be allowed to own property and this would free them from the demands of, of working thereby leaving them to dedicate their life to reading. Equally important for Aristotle was the formulation of a constitution that would ensure that those in power exercise it for the benefit of the public good. John Locke seized on the importance of a constitution or a social contract as he called it. Before constituting a state, citizens should first agree on the social contract a sort of a set of norms and rules by which they'll abide. And this is not any other social contract, but Locke called it an agency social contract. It differs from the alienation social contract where the citizenry defers to the state. The agency social contract ensures that the citizenry remains the ultimate authority for whose benefit public institutions are geared. Foundational values and attended responsibilities the state pledges towards its citizenry are pursued through public institutions. Through this role, public institutions are both incubators and instrument of the state. They are guided by and reproduce foundational values. Compliance with these values, which were adopted by popular consensus, boosts their legitimacy. Though clear in purpose and functions, their level of efficacy and design are not a given. Historical background, class structure, and the moment of their inception all matter in the molding of their institutional designs. This accounts for their variance in each country, even though similar in intent and function. Fukuyama's epic text, The Origins of Political Order, is instructive in this regard. Consider, for instance, the application of the principle of the rule of law and political accountability. Fukuyama ascribes the contrasting treatment of the principle of the rule of law in Western Europe on the one hand and, and Russia and China, and China on the other hand to the relative strength of the church. The moral teaching, especially the value of the sameness of humanity, was central in the entrenching of the practice of of equality that would become commonplace in democracies. 
Unlike in Western Europe, churches lacked autonomy in Russia and China. Monarchs ruled unrestrained by moral considerations, making their drain arbitrary and unpredictable. Conversely, the Western Church contested the monarchical claims as the ultimate political authority. Papacy, for instance, considered itself the superior authority to which monarchs should be answerable. Besides simply believing so, the Catholic Church had wealth and military resources to back up its claims. So strong in its belief, the church was even willing to go to war with the monarch, and it did. And so for a time between the 6th and 15th century, Europe especially was marked by the struggle for power between the church and state over who should be, who should be the supreme authority. Even after the state had finally gained some ascendance over the church in the 12th century, religious influence in public affairs did not entirely vanish. Possessed, dispossessed of its properties and denied political sway, the church still insisted on running its own affairs, independent of political interference. To assert this right, it drew from the legal precedence, the Justian Code, a compilation of the Roman law produced in, six, in, in the sixth century. The Justian Code became the basis of the modern civil law. It formed part of the law curriculum taught at universities. In this way, churches spread their influence throughout the state, not only through laying the basis of civil law, but through cadres of lawyers they were trained in that jurisprudence. What is most important for our papers here is that this religious-based law laid the basis for the, for the supremacy of the rule of law. Political, political authority had to act within and comply with the law. That's how political, political authorities legitimize their rule, and this has its origins in the history of the tussle between the church of state, uh, between the church and state, dating back to the th to the sixth century. If the history of ideas over what constitute a legitimate political authority shaped modern law, class structure molded the character of states. It determined their, uh, their disposition to whether they became democracies or not. The presence of wealthy classes that were independent of the monarch were able to force their representation in the structures of authority. Monarchs were always keen to collect tax, either to fund war or build uh, uh, bureaucracies. The, the nobility and the, the gentry could refuse to pay tax because they had sufficient wealth to mobilize opposition. Because they had developed economic interests, they wanted to be represented in order to introduce policies that would meet their interest. No taxation without representation was their rallying call. Unable to compel them but desperate for their taxes, monarchs were forced into a compromise. Representation in exchange for payment of tax and so democracies based on limited franchise was born by men of property. As the class structure changed due to forced migration of the peasantry into urban employment, new demands emerged from the working class to be represented. They wanted a voice through franchise to ease their life of, of misery wrought by capitalist exploitation. Fearful of the instability threatened by the hostile unwashed masses, the ruling elite decided to grant them representation. Within this body, workers could articulate their demands in a civilized manner, rather than threaten mayhem. Parliamentary representation did not mean the end of conflict. What it meant instead was that conflict would be institutionalized. I've provided this brief history to illustrate the point that states Manifested through institutions are a product of society, class structure, and social factors. All these are not static, but change over time, which inevitably impact on their efficacy, especially because they were conceived at a particular point in time. Later, I elaborate on the ensuing incongruence, which is a problem of our time. For now, let me turn my attention towards home. 
Consistent with the global history of state formation, the post-apartheid institutions are an offshoot of our past. These institutions represent both a rejection and validation of that past simultaneously. The, re the rejection stems from the simple fact that the pre-94 institutions would have been an anomaly, if not centers of opposition in the democratic age. Consider, for instance, the makeup and the functioning of the public service under, under union and, and apartheid governments. The founding ideology of the union was racial supremacy guided by the composition, guided both at the composition and the conduct of the public service. It was staffed exclusively by whites who implemented racist laws and went on to police their observance. They arrested and prosecuted those who defied these laws and went on to guard them in prison so that they would not escape. For most, their implementation of these racist policies was not simply a fulfillment of their employment contract. They were believers. Even those who purported to be liberals or friends of the natives could not countenance the idea of universal franchise. They supported territorial and institutional segregation. For the natives tolerated to reside in the urban areas, the union government introduced the sale of alcohol through beer halls to generate revenue that would meet their social needs. The state from the 1920s got into the business of selling alcohol and encouraged natives through advertisement to drink as much as they could so that it could generate revenue. Competitors such as the township-based Shibins were declared illegal. Only the state could get natives intoxicated. Upon assuming power in 1948, African nationalists furthered the spread of racist ideology into public consciousness. They were much more organized and systematic in their approach. Their single-mindedness arose from organizational cohesion expressed through the Bruder Bond. Formed in 1918, the Africana elite, business people, and professionals, the purpose of the bond was to advance the interest of Africaners, that is Dutch descendants, whom they had mobilized into a coherent group by, by inventing a language, Afrikaans, revising history, and manipulating religion. Africaners came to believe that they were the chosen folk to civilize the barbarian natives. Racial prejudice ceased being the subject of oratory only. It was part of the curriculum instilled at schools and universities. Non-racial universities faced the wrath of the state and ethnic-oriented universities emerged. A pan-African university forte could only accept Tosa speakers and other African language speakers had universities built for them in their similarly ethnic Bantustan. For the racist state to hold, Africaners realized that it had to cultivate consent by imparting a complementary ethos both in its beneficiaries and subjects. And whites filled positions of authority in African universities. Their role was to ensure that black universities do not veer off the official curriculum. Appointees were not chosen randomly. They were drawn from the ranks of the brother bond. They were appointed throughout state institutions, right from the district level to national institutions. These were devotees who had vowed to uphold the interests of the folk and guard them against the Swar Khafar. These are institutions the new government awoke to at the dawn of democracy in 1994. Steeped in the culture of racial bigotry and they looked the part. Placed at the top of a society that had just taken a collective oath to march towards non-racialism and inequality or equality, the dismemberment of these institutions was a given. It was inevitable and necessity. And the newly freed men and women were not bewildered over what ethos would guide the new institutions. The new dawn had a rich past to draw from. Alongside resistant politics, marked by death, detention, and torture, a new democratic and non-racial culture evolved. 
This was manifest in the wild networks of associational life that had characterized black activity in the townships and, and the factory floor. Popular participation was the basis of decision making. Leaders were elected and would only represent their members upon getting authorization. This was the social capital that democratic South Africa inherited at birth. Even before approval, the interim constitution in 1993 had inserted some of these values that had been nurtured. The collective identity that had been formed became evident in the agreement over who qualified for franchise and who was to be part of the IEC that would oversee the first election. Instead of limiting franchise to the local born, eligible Eligibility to cognizance of the exile background of, the several, uh, of several political activists. They had conceived children whilst in exile, and this offspring considered South Africa home. It seemed cruel, therefore, that upon finally arriving home, they would be denied franchise. So all children born to those who had been in exile, it was concluded, were allowed the right to vote. So this inter international experience of, of the anti-apartheid struggle became part of the culture that informed especially the conception around who qualified to vote. Unlike in other pre-independence countries, negotiators insisted on steering their own in inaugural elections instead of allowing institutions like the UN to do so. This is where rival nationalisms, Africa, African and Africana, came together in their national pride and, and, and sovereignty. They would not have an, an outside body determine their fate. The same nationalist sentiment determined participation of foreign-based observers. They were a, a minority in this body, um, the majority of whom were locals, and the role given to the foreign-based participants, or rather commissioners, was simply to advise, and the local-born commissioners had the final decision-making uh, powers. What would become of whites in a majority rule South Africa, however, is a question that continued to linger. Aware of the misery they had visited upon their dark-skinned counterparts, White society feared vengeance. The Swart Khafar had been a constant presence in a collective psyche. psyche. African, nationalists, African nationalist leaders were aware of this fear and sensitive to its potential to abort the transition. The resulted formula on the allocation of seats in parliament the formation of the government of, of, of national unity and job protection were introduced to ease the anxiety of the white community over what would befall them under black rule. Proportional representation enabled the presence of a diverse range of parties, however small they were. Parliament reflected diversity and representation. No community or ideological strand could, could complain of being marginalized. Former rivals would take joint decisions in government, reassuring the watching, the watching public that the laws were approved, that were approved would be considerate of the diverse interests that, that made up our country. These institutional arrangements conferred legitimacy upon the new state removing any possibility of a gripe, especially among the sober-minded in our midst, that would spark a rejection of the new dawn. Some analyses have described the appropriateness of these institutions to the benevolence of our leaders, especially Nelson Mandela. This is true, but to a point. Admittedly, they could have insisted on a different institutional arrangement one that was unaccommodating of the, of the anxiety of whites. Stubborn demands might as well have secured them their own sectional wishes. Ultimately, though, the balance of power set the parameters of what was possible. The very agreement to enter into negotiations instead of continuing with, with oppression and the armed 
uh, resistance was itself an admission that none was more powerful than the other. It was an impasse. The declining state of the South African economy coupled with the increasing inability for the insurgents to sustain their insurgency added to the agency to break the deadlock. Unable to do so by forcing one to submit to the will of the other, compromise became the only available route towards a breakthrough. The evenness of the balance of power, therefore, compelled the rivals towards a compromise. It was a practical solution to a real constraint. Notwithstanding the, pr the practical constraints, the normative orientation of the insurgents also predisposed them towards accommodative transracial politics. Almost 50 years ago, they had, co uh, they had committed themselves to a non-racial citizenship based on residence, not indigeneity. That commitment contained in a historical document titled The Freedom Charter was contentious within the ranks. Some couldn't fathom the embrace of those who had treated them as subhuman to the point of breaking away to affirm what they thought was the right reaction that South Africa belongs to its natives. The depth of conviction in the sameness of mankind, however, survived the split within the liberation movement. Theirs was not an, an expedient or opportunistic advocacy of equality, but was a key part of their consciousness. Instead of, of emulating their erstwhile oppressors, they insisted on affirming who they are. Whites were not standard bearers, Steve Biko would tell a judge almost 25 years later. The anti-apartheid struggle, Steve Biko enlightened the judge, was not a quest to seize what whites possessed and mimic their modes of life, but to create a society where one could be the best they could be. This strength of conviction in the universality of humanity has its roots in our indigenous value system and religious-based education taught to the early nationalists. Human beings are considered inherently decent. Deviant behavior is explained away as a life occasioned, as a lapse occasioned by social circumstances. For this reason, punishment was meted out with the purpose to rehabilitate the offender. Religious-based education reinforced the belief in the sameness of humanity. Man is born in the image of God. That's what missionaries taught early nationalists at mission schools from the early 1800s. Unlike in Europe, where church competed with secular authority for political power and was able to exert its moral influence on the law, in colonial South Africa, it was never like that. The colonial states were firmly in charge. Christianity was successful amongst early nationalists. Schooling was syn synonymous with Christianization. Mission stations served as a church and school. One fed into the other. Literacy enabled conflict, converts to read the Bible, which is an integral part of worship. Literate African Christians also went on to become evangelists. African evangelists were instrumental in spreading the gospel further. They not only gave Christianity a familiar face, but also preached it in their native language, making it easier for their intended recruits to understand and convert. The principle of equality, therefore, was, central, was a central part of the value system espoused by the early African elite. Whilst not actively involved in the spreading, in, in the spreading of, of, uh, of Christianity, the colonial state initially affirmed the belief in equality. The constitutions of Natal and Cape colonies adopted in the 1850s granted franchise to Africans. One only needed to be literate and own property of a certain value. Theirs was called a civilizing mission. Equality for all civilized men, Cecil Rhodes sloganeered in the 1890s as part of his campaign. 
Their embrace of equality, however, was short-lived. The number of African voters increased to a point where white politicians, especially liberals, feared that they would be swamped. The fear was that Africans would start voting for their own leaders instead of the white politicians, and they had been, as they had been doing. By the beginning of the 1890s, several measures had been introduced to limit African franchise. Property qualification was increased, disqualifying many Africans who had been eligible. Africans appropriately called these measures utungum lom, literally meaning their mouth was sewed up. The missionaries, too, proved not different from the colonial politicians. Though preaching brotherhood, they would later deny the African brethren promotion to positions of authority in church. The African clergy correctly saw their denial of equal treatment as a betrayal of the Christian principle of brotherhood. They broke away to form their own churches, especially from the 1890s. Some of them went on to form the Amy Church. Here, they found support from their counterparts in the United States. Their breakaway marked the onset of distrust for their white counterparts. Those who ventured into active politics would do the same. Setting up the ANC in 1912, they denied non-Africans membership in the newly formed organization. They had learned the lesson, as the popular saying went, ungazum <laughs> tembum and relied on their own agency instead. In setting up their own exclusive organization, however, the African elite were not rejecting non-racialism. They were simply affirming their own humanity that they were just as capable as their white counterpart and shrugging off white tutelage in order to achieve their own objectives. It was an exercise in self-assertion. They continued to believe dearly in equality and denounced their white counterparts for breach of the Christian message of equality. An equal society remained a key part of their vision for a new South Africa. That was boldly articulated as noted above in the Freedom Charter and would be carried through into the social contract that would form the foundation of a new non-racial and democratic South Africa. Magnanimity, in inclusiveness and equality, all qualities that underpin and molded public culture and institutions in this country were a product of our own long history. They are an expression of our collective identity. Departing from this strong institutional footing, the post-apartheid elite, however, soon began to show signs of a, of a weakening resolve to pursue public, policy, public policies that, though unpopular, were necessary for long-term sustainability of the transformative project. Alongside the creeping resort to expediency was the lack of vigilance to adopt what were introduced and tr as transitional measures to the new changing context. One such a transitional measure that lapsed into permanence by default was the elevation of the role of, of politicians in the, in the employment of bureaucrats. Admittedly, political involvement was forced by the unpalatable composition of the bureaucracy and inheritance from the apartheid order. A number of civil servants were apartheid loyalists whose commitment to pursue new policies was questionable, and they were retained for the initial five years as part of the post-apartheid settlement to ease their acceptance of the new order. Instead of the public service, public service commission, as was the case previously, Politicians made appointments of executive managers throughout the various layers of the state. Most of the appointees were drawn from the, leg, from the ranks of, of the progressive individuals that were part of the, of the NGO sector and the academy. The new party in power kept a close eye on the appointments to a point of setting up a committee that would influence their new recruits. For a governing party elected based on its manifesto, 
The keen interest on the new bureaucrats was not unusual. New within government, having demonstrated their commitment to the, to the public good through self-sacrifice, there was no reason to believe that the new political elite would abuse this power. There was laxity in creating institutional measures that would preempt abuse and guarantee the independence of civil servants. Perhaps worse than laxity was the failure to heed the signs of self-aggrandizement that cropped up in the early years. As laws were being formulated to create proper separation of roles, politicians exploited their involvement in the allocation of tenders to their own benefit. They set up companies and did business with the state, especially in the municipalities. When new laws were finally introduced by, by 2004, councillors had become too accustomed to abusing their power for self-gain. It was too late for them to retreat, and so they continued. Seeing that managers were now responsible for deciding on allocation of tenders, they insisted on appointing their own managers, managers they could, they could manipulate to issue tenders to their own proxies. Some managers willingly went along with this manipulation for their own financial benefit. Those who declined were forced to comply to ensure that they were reappointed. Councillors who hold power to hire and fire did not take kindly to those who declined their improper approaches. They would even fight among themselves over who should be appointed. Some of these fights have led to vacancies and unending interim appointments to the detriment of service delivery. And because they dispense patronage, inefficient and, mal and malfeasant managers never faced consequences. The Auditor General's constant reminders to investigate possible fraud and, and, and malfeasance were hardly followed up. Scant attention to the use of the public, uh, public purse reflected the, the disposition of the political elite towards the state. To them, the state had ceased being an instrument for transformation. It had become a source of livelihood for themselves. This was not entirely surprising. There was no alternative source of, they had no alternative source of, of employment. Involvement in the anti-apartheid anti struggle resulted in prison, exile, and, and expulsion from school. They did not have qualifications for gainful employment elsewhere. And the, and the, and the precarity of their only source of employment, that is the public service, or rather the public office, led them towards building a nest for an uncertain future. So they rationalize their plunder of public resources. Their predatory activities, however, led to the neglect of the proper functioning of the state. Companies have had to uproot their operations in search of other towns where councils would hopefully heed their pleas for proper roles and timely approval of, of licenses. Such relocations led to decline of the local revenue that is already slim. This in turn makes it even more difficult for municipalities to maintain their infrastructure. The new government had decided earlier on that the grants it, 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 it provides to the municipalities should be used strictly to install the new infrastructure. That decision made sense. There was no infrastructure to maintain in the townships. Townships needed new infrastructure to be installed. But it then said, for the, for, for the infrastructure to be maintained, municipalities must generate their own tax. So without the ability to make their own tax, it means that they cannot maintain their own infrastructure. Not paying attention to the local revenue has meant that the old infrastructure has been left to rot. Water leakages amounting to 30% of water in some areas are now commonplace. Besides not doing their duties, the gloomy state of the local revenue that characterizes most municipalities is also a culmination of decisions that were taken 
for political for or for electoral immediate electoral gains. Though deciding to enforce people to pay for rates and taxes, local leaders in the mid 90s never followed up to ensure that people actually paid. When people protested saying even those who could pay, when they started protesting that they didn't want to pay, local leaders easily gave up because to insist was to risk losing votes. So residents got used to non-payment, leaving municipalities with little, if anything, in terms of taxes to maintain their infrastructure. The current state of public institutions therefore reflects our politics, public activism, and political culture. Their weaknesses are a collective indictment. They benefit some whilst indifferent to the plight of most in society. The beneficiaries have little in their have little interest in their improvement. This explains their decline. Where change has happened, it is because certain brave individuals have done so. One such rare change was triggered by former Auditor General Kimi Makwetu. His efforts, his efforts to get politicians to, get, to curb wasteful expenditure had gone unheeded for years. Instead of continuing to rely on the politicians, Makwetu turned to the Chief Justice of the Constitutional Court, Mohueng Mohueng. He invited him to an international gathering of ages who had come from across the world, and Makwetu proposed to Mohueng Mohueng that he must issue a call that his findings should be binding. And the Corn Court had just done the same in relation to the public protector. So Mohueng realized that because the public protector did the same function as the AG, he should issue a similar binding call. And Mohueng did that. Politicians complied because they were ashamed. At the time, they had faced public outrage for being complicit in the wastage of resources at Nkanja. Parliament was seen to be complicit in that scandal. And so legislators introduced new law to redeem themselves. Makwetu had realized the potential of the moment to offer change and seized it. There may not be many Makwetus out there for transformative, sustainable changes to happen, much wider societal agitation is needed. Political costs prompt politicians into action. The present rumblings are encouraging, but South Africa is crying for much more. Inefficiencies of public institutions reflect our own collective weaknesses. Only an active and an outraged citizenry can effect meaningful change. Vugani Bantu. <laughs> Dr. Noluta Vukusa, the acting vice chancellor, thank you very much for welcoming us to our university. The executive dean, Professor Camilla Naidu, thank you very much for introducing um, the professor to become. Um, you're not the other professor. <laughs> you need to be reminded. <laughs> Um, thank you so much for a wonderful inaugural lecture, marking your investiture in the pinnacle of the ideational sphere, and congratulations for this extraordinary milestone. I don't know how you did it, but it is often not easy to straddle the realm of academic language and that of being easily accessible in giving an open lecture in an academic setup, but you did it so wonderfully. 
um, I can assure you that almost everybody in here had you. And uh, in our own different ways, we are very much in conversation with you. And we are saying that politics are not <laughs> evil. Men are. And you reminded us that institutional arrangements are a function of multiplicity of factors in their contestation and intersections. And this dates far back from the very origin of state itself. And you traversed this history for reasons of context. From the onset, typical you, you did not beat about the bush in reiterating what has always been the angst of society in relation to our public institution, you said they are in a horrible state. Many agree with you, especially in so far as our local sphere of government is concerned. Indeed, it's true that often when the Auditor General give her report, you know, when you interact with the report, it starts to become a very you know, a painful text for one to go through. And also, we, we, we knew this for some time. The Zondo Commission did not tell us what we did not know. The, the thesis of your lecture is so edifying in trying to assist to understand what our public institution are, why our public institution are in this state. Your proposition, or rather contention, is that precarity of our public institution is a function of incongruence between their form on the one hand and the challenges of the moment. And this explains institutional inability to adapt to the exigencies of the evolution of the post apartheid state. In other words, what we are contending with is anachronism which seems to have institutionalized inertia in terms of institution building. Here, I am talking about public institution which their architecture belong to the past but are managed to address contemporary realities. I often get surprised that almost three decades into democracy, we are still seized with these contradictions, despite the fact that at the very foundation of our tries with destiny in the early 90s, we had made, it, we had made clear the type of public institution that we, want, that we wanted to drive South Africa's democracy. Let me give you a simple example. Um, to, uh, um, um, to take, for example, this important aspect of our social contract related to building public institutions. I quote, we said in the early 90s, this is what we said, there shall be an efficient, non-partisan, career-orientated, public service, public institution, broadly representative of the South African community functioning on a basis of fairness and which shall serve members of the public in an unbiased and impartial manner and shall in the exercise of its power and in compliance with its duty loyally execute the, law the lawful policy of the government of the day in their performance of its administrative uh, function, close quote. Of course, there are many in, in, in the audience who will immediately recognize that this is one of the 34 principles which the multi-party negotiation process had forged a consensus on in the early 90s. This principle had shaped particularly chapter 10 of the Constitution, which had laid a solid uh, a foundation for state capacity and institution uh, capability building. The Constitution prescribed principle which underscore that public administration should be institutionalized as a profession, embrace the, the, the merit principle, and should espouse the values of poverty, neutrality, and fairness. All these are key principles in building and managing public institutions. You'll, you'll remember um, 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 uh, Dr. Vincent Mapai's commission, which uh, Mandela had set up in 1996 to advise him on the type of the public service required or public institution required to drive the democratic system of government. 
He emphasized this principle in his report. Almost two decades later, since the inception of the democratic dispensation, a long range plan which had mapped the country's future as the blueprint for social economic transformation emphasized what has always been um, um, the fundamentals of building public institutions required to serve the public uh, good. With all this, why are our public institution st still stuck in the model which had been designed for transitional purposes, despite a clear articulation of their architecture beyond the interim arrangement in the early days of our democracy? You attempted to answer that question. <laughs> in an attempt to answer this question, I just want to add another slant to your thesis in saying that South Africa does not lack great ideas in terms of state uh, capacity and institution capability building, but the agency to see those ideas through. By way of example, let me illustrate what I'm saying. Earlier, I made reference to the Constitution um, prescribing important principles to shape institution building. It took almost two decades since the, since the adoption of the Constitution um, 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 uh, for this principle to be written into a legislation governing public institution, governing public administration. Um, remember the constitution came, came into effect in 1997? 90, 90, it was adopted in 1996. Um, there were some issues there, but it came into effect, the actual effect in 1997. Public Administration Management Act, which seeks to promote the basic values and principle in chapter 10 of the Constitution could only be written into that law in 2014. Look at the gap. NDP was adopted by all political parties in parliament in 2012. Initiative to amend existing legislative framework to incorporate its recommendation on state capacity and institution capability uh, building only started in 2021 and an, a year to conclude. This is 10 years since the NDP's adoption. And where have we made, and, and where we have made pocket of, of excellence, we did not make leverage. We did not um, uh, leverage on them on a larger scale. Here I am referring to uh, South African revenue services, you know, which became a model of institution building. To the extent that Harvard University used it as a case study for teaching. I know that at some point in its evolution, it was nearly run down by the machination of state capture. Thanks God SARS is still there. Because if SARS was, was, was captured, I don't really think that by now we'll be talking about the country. Still on SARS, despite the fact that it experiences some challenges, its instructional value on institutional reform for public organization is still very much important. What am I saying with all this? I'm saying we seem to be unable to learn from our own foresight. We seem to be unable to learn from our own wisdom. We seem to be unable to learn from our own accidental pockets of excellence, which had come about in fashioning the evolution of the post apartheid state. In other words, whatever that works, we kill it. Ionically, whatever that fosters our demise, we cherish it. And that is what Prof called collective indictment. My take from your lecture, Prof, as I conclude, because this is your occasion, I don't want to steal your thunder. <laughs> My take from your lecture as I conclude is that when interim arrangements in terms of the organization of public institution become permanent, the ability of the very institutions that we expect them to grow and mature become inherently vitiated and ultimately atrophy become their faith. I conclude by saying congratulations and um, uh, welcome to the club. Thank you so much. Uh -huh. <laughs>
you very much, Professor. I now have the pleasure of calling the inductee and also Professor Camila Naidu to your full professorship. Ladies and gentlemen, can we please give another rousing round of applause? Now we buy can do it up. Now we Rebecca can do it up. Congratulations, Professor Ndlekiana. You have demonstrated that the gown can go to town. <laughs> Education, ladies and gentlemen, is useless if it is not relevant to people's issues. And I think Professor Ndlekiana has displayed that perfectly well. And so thank you for an illustrious lecture. Your discipline has no dead ends. For as long as people are around, your discipline is relevant. And I would like to wish you, on behalf of the executive of the university, as well as the council of the university, a very good career ahead. I heard you say this was it. There are such things as emeritus professor, distinguished <laughs> professor. You still have to distinguish yourself amongst the professors. May I extend a world of uh, Appreciation to everyone who took time to come here. I do know that you have your family, your mom, uh, your wife, your children, your nieces, your nephews, your in-laws, your friends, and everybody else that you care about is here. And uh, would I therefore, uh, by the powers vested in me, dissolve this congregation? <laughs> May I also invite you to some refreshments on your left when you go out. So thank you. Before we do that, can I please, sorry about that, um, extend a very warm word of appreciation to the respondent, Professor Herbert. Thank you so much. <laughs> I would also like to acknowledge that we also have the Vice Chancellor from UNISA who's in attendance here as well. Of course, they are all luminaries around us, but I thought because they are sister universities or brother universities, I could just say, but everybody else is distinguished. So thank you so much and good evening to you.